When one explores the most fascinating and ancient of structures resting all over our planet, you will inevitably be confronted by baffling feats on engineering and ingenuity, tasks that, to modern man, escape understanding or indeed explanation. The main consensus regarding these ancient structures has always been a tricky thing to explain. To claim that these marvelous structures were built by primitive people with only primitive tools at their disposal does not only seem absurd to most who have visited such sites, but ignorant of their true past grandeur and the specific characteristics of each of these places. Ancient sites, such as Giza, Machu Picchu, among many others, still contain very confusing artifacts, anomalous evidence, which tells a very different story to that of mainstream history. Apart from the Baghdad Battery, largely claimed to have been an ancient form of electroplating, there has been little in the way of physical evidence to suggest the use of electricity within the academically researched ancient times. Yet, there are many remnants left which suggest such activities. Not only are there countless clear examples of past machine work stone, but most importantly, there is evidence of errors made by these same tools, misstarts and discovered fault lines, these particular stones discarded, laid bare in the quarries, revealing all the hallmarks of the machine engineering that went into building these wonderful places, these artifacts, once rubbish, now historical treasures. They can tell you the shape and movements of the tools that were being used, showing just how these machines cut into the stones, core drillings also discarded during manufacture, and cut stones discarded due to faults and cracks, revealing the complete preliminary cut marks left by the ancient stone cutters. These fragments of past activities are clearly some of the most important in unraveling these sites' ultimate secrets, yet it is rarely shared in the public arena and even less frequently researched by official bodies. Along with this vast and perplexing array of remnants, mercilessly left where they fell, strewn amongst the debris of disruption, lay countless extremely hardy machine stone jars, vessels made from some of the hardest rocks on Earth. Some of these jars were made with a round bottom, perfectly machined, balanced on a base no bigger than the tip of a chicken's egg. Sir William Flinders Petrie ultimately realized that only lathe turning could have produced the symmetry and balance found on thousands of these bowls and vases. And Petrie was no fool. In 1894, he founded his own archaeological body, the Egyptian Research Account, which later became the British School of Archaeology in Egypt. He stated, For example, a bowl maker attained curves of exact circularity by rotating the bowl around a fixed blade and formed a lip by shifting the centering of the bowl. Another round bottom vase had walls of such uniform thickness that it balanced perfectly on a curved base. To have a very well-respected researcher and specialist of the ancient Egyptians to admit to a conviction of the use of power tools in these pots construction seems like quite a stunning position to take, especially when one considers that while metal chisels could have been used to shape soft limestone within ancient Egyptian times, the metals that were available to them – copper, bronze, and during the first millennium BCE, wrought iron – were far too soft to work such rock into such exquisite designs. It seems Petri would like to remain honest regarding his conclusions, yet also incomplete with his explanations preferring to let the receiver of said information make their own realizations, preferring to avoid complication by a, by this time, rather visible enemy. One could only conclude that these relics and ancient monuments thereof were not the work of the Egyptians. But further evidence to suggest that these baffling structures were built far before the ancient Egyptians, before academic understandings, by a highly technologically advanced pre-cataclysm civilization. We find it difficult to see how such work was undertaken or an explanation for our finding can be made without the use of power tools. Thankfully, the more we learn regarding these enigmatic places, the more we become aware of regarding their true history, and the closer, it seems, we become to finding those who built them. 
When asked what are the largest, heaviest, and indeed the once most difficult stones to ever have been cut, transported to, and precisely placed within the great structures of the Giza Plateau, we would have previously stated that the granite ceiling blocks found within the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid were the largest known, with some of these stones weighing as much as 100 tons. However, it turns out that there exist many other stones upon this mysteriously created plateau, which far exceed the pyramid's inner megaliths. Unsurprisingly, these discoveries are rarely shared academically, or indeed to the many people who pay to visit the Giza Plateau each year. The Valley Temple is but one example of these other, less mentioned, marvelously enormous stones, eight of which are still present within the structure's ruin the largest of which still being roughly 3 by 3 by 6 meters in size. Furthermore, the same similarly sized stones can also be found within the Kefren Pyramid Causeway Temple. The structure is also rarely discussed or shared by Egyptologists or archaeologists alike. It seems that academics who fear a loss of funding from particular bodies tend to merely ignore that which they are confronted with which they simply cannot explain. Again, the same enigmatic megalithic blocks can be found in the causeway temple of the Miserinus Pyramid. One finds the same highly eroded, thus extremely ancient stones. It seems that these huge stones seemingly litter the Giza complex, and amazingly, they are successfully ignored merely due to their controversy. Yet, the largest to be found anywhere upon this man-made plateau are to be found hidden in plain sight. Overlooked for many millennia, the still remaining foundation stones, upon which much of the east side of the Kefren Pyramid once stood, were not lifted into place, but were indeed transported to this location and precisely placed into position. These stones are so massive and so perfectly dropped into the surrounding landscape that thousands of people have walked right over them every year without ever realizing what they were standing on. Although the true depth and thus complete scale of the block is currently unknown, if it is of a cubic shape, it would appear to be roughly three-quarters the weight of the pregnant woman of Baalbek. She weighs around 1,001 tons, which would make our foundation stone anywhere from 500 to 750 tons in weight. Clearly, a controversial yet incredible discovery, one which takes our understandings of the sheer undertaking that was Giza, are still at an early stage. Nonetheless, such discoveries move us one step closer towards finally understanding just who could have built the Great Pyramid Complex of Egypt. Many ancient sites found all over the world can no longer be explained away with currently attested academic opinion. Who they say built them, why, or when they were created. The most popular of these anomalies are the ancient monuments that can be found upon the Giza Plateau. Currently explained as having been built by our copper tool-wielding ancestors a mere 4,000 years ago, somehow successfully creating some of the most precisely built and indeed enormous ancient structures found on Earth, decidedly choosing to use granite blocks many tons in weight as their building material of choice. Ironically, although these sites are somehow exclaimed as having been built by the ancient Egyptians, any actual, literal explanation of how this was actually done has never been provided. Not only is academic opinion severely lacking any logical understandings as to the construction of these sites, they seemingly attempt to ignore and, in some cases, conceal additional controversial anomalies they simply cannot understand. Enormous stone megaliths are hidden all over Giza, and especially around the base of the Great Pyramids. And not only were these buildings adorned with incredibly hard granite, but also basalt, a similarly tough stone, and another which would be near impossible to have hewn with mere copper implements. Known as Giza's basalt floor, it is what many people now see as the smoking gun for evidence of advanced engineering 
having once been responsible for the construction of the site. Amongst the remaining fragments of the basalt floor is overwhelming evidence of ancient machinery, telltale precision signatures left on many stones, suggesting high technology was responsible for the shaping of Giza's enormous stones. Cut marks that could only have been left by high-speed disc cutting, striations, precise ridges and countless other curious features have been thankfully left upon these stones, and these surviving tool marks could one day be used to actually identify the technology once used to build the site. We now feel that the evidence to suggest that the modern attested and mass-published theories regarding the origins of the Giza Plateau, its age, and indeed its creator's past capabilities, is currently incorrect and is now overwhelming, and that it is only a matter of time before a revival of this past knowledge and indeed understandings again begins to flourish. Egypt Undoubtedly, one of the most controversial places for modern history to try to keep the control of in regards to its origin, its true age, or original builder. When one either visits the Giza Plateau and is lucky enough to gaze upon these three great pyramids, or merely able to peer upon them through their computer screens, the first thing that will usually cross one's mind is awe and amazement. Yet this is often instinctually followed by an air of wonder, a curiosity as to how these miraculous structures were built, who could have possibly built them, and most importantly of all, why. Yet these questions, and indeed the pursuit of their answers, has been a mission for many well-funded deceptive individuals, for many years, to work very hard to distract you from either asking or pursuing as personal line of inquiry. For example, the Golden Mask of King Tut, along with the many other undoubtedly spectacularly valuable artifacts, encrusted with precious metals and jewels that can be seen littering Egypt in its many museums and in the mountains of literature, books, and touring exhibits, which are published, pushed, and permitted in regards to this spectacular area of human history. Grand Egyptian Museum late last month was an exciting event for archaeologists worldwide and a source of pride for Egyptians. We moved today the sixth and the last chariot of King Tutankhamun from the, from the military museum in the citadel, which was there since 1987, to the gem. So we were keen to show you the moving of this uh, very nice artifact and the packing and unpacking uh, method, uh, professional method you are using by my colleagues in the ministry. The Tutankhamun exhibit, comprising about 5,000 pieces, will display for the first time all of Tutankhamun's artifacts in one place. Experts from around the world have been consulted on how best to preserve and display the collection. When museum workers accidentally knocked off the beard of King Tut's burial mask in 2015 and hastily glued it back on, there were fears that modern chemicals would cause permanent damage to the artifact. But scholars around the world put their heads together to save the golden mask. The museum will also be a venue for international conferences on Egyptology. There is something new always. We found out today in my talk, the family of Tutankhamun through DNA. How Tutankhamun died. No one murdered him. My excavation in the Valley of the Monks that we are doing right now, important excavation looking for the tomb of Archis in Amun. Maybe soon a tomb will be revealed in the Valley of the Monks or the West Valley. Of the kings. Most of the artifacts in the Tutankhamun exhibit have been relocated from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Their new home is only about two kilometers away from the place where the young pharaoh's tomb was discovered in 1922. Egyptian officials say the gem will be the world's largest archaeological museum when completed and will hold about 100,000 artifacts in total. We have now 3,000 employees and workmen working inside the project. We are respecting our schedule. We'll be ready from the engineering uh, part by December 2018, and we are deciding now the perfect time or the ideal timing for the partial opening. In addition to King Tut's exhibit, the museum will display objects related to some of the greatest historic Egyptian kings, such as Ramses II, Akhenaten, 
and Amenhotep III. The ancient Egyptians, although claimed as ingenious, were merely adaptive. Just like the equally acclaimed Romans and Incas of Peru, these re-inhabitants merely rediscovered the creations of a far older, far more advanced predecessor, who I believe not only constructed these sanctuaries, which these well-studied ancient civilizations merely used to enable the flourishment of their own cultures, in turn, leaving a smorgasbord of architectural artifacts for funded academics to excavate and subsequently parade around, usually bombarding many individuals with deep insights into their lifestyles, culture, and death practices, are yet, as I would have predicted, nearly always absent, that which supports my posit. Any logical explanation or demonstration of how these people built these structures in which they once inhabited like a void in their academic study, one which is not only consistently ignored and concealed by these same academics, but are unknown facts to all of modern humanity to this day. This mystery is a result of the incredible nature of these structures, the precision involved in their constructions, and the enormity of some of the stones used in the building of the structures. Many of you may have seen my recent videos or be a keen follower of my work and, as such, are aware of the fact that due to my in-depth study of the unknowns regarding these sites worldwide and the collection and collaboration of the similarities and differentiabilities I have personally collected and categorized regarding many of these ancient structures, I have personally been able to establish a very strong, evidence-based hypothesis regarding the identity of three separate lost civilizations, which I have established using signatures within their style of building, and by default differentiations in their styles of building, to unquestionably identify them as separate yet particular groups responsible for the different unexplainable structures spanning the entire globe. Yet, although these groups have indeed crossed paths, such areas as Aswan Quarry and most significant to my own research in Italy, where the polygonal civilization built upon the Cyclopeans' work, allowing me to establish which preceded which, and although these groups have been established to have abandoned projects midway through, thus indicating that they came to a sudden and untimely demise due to cataclysm, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and indeed the movement of the blocks at Baalbek in China, which all far exceed 1,000 tons, is yet another civilization which far predated all which I have already identified. These three civilizations are the Polygonal Civilization, the Cyclopean Civilization, and the Neolithic Civilization each with their own unique building techniques and identifiable stone-cutting signatures in their technologies. The pyramid builders were unimaginably more capable than all three, and although the Neoliths, who indeed have created some astonishingly advanced ruins, could have quite possibly been a surviving remnant of this civilization, this digression is for another time. Though at sites such as Baalbek, the trilithon, which contains stones over 1,000 tons, there are cyclopean stones built atop the stones, and at other places in the world, polygonal masonry has been found, such as Aksum in Ethiopia, where the toppled obelisk is said by some to be in excess of 1,000 tons. I have never, and now strongly feel will never, find any indicative evidence of these civilizations building the footings under any of these gigantic megaliths as they were not responsible for their creation or placement. Additionally, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and these enormous megalithic blocks elsewhere, were also the civilization who created the false door, a mysterious rock-carved feature also found littering the now-exposed mega-metropolis found beneath the Guatemalan rainforest by penetrative radar. Taikal, part of this metropolis, the place where the plaque illustrating a past global cataclysm was once found, also has pyramids built solely leading to these false doors, with one found in Peru, built into the only rock face containing a very peculiar crystal known for its resonance qualities in amplifying radio waves. I feel that much of the spectacles found in modern Egyptian museums are merely distractions from the really important truths 
which we should all be focusing on instead. Such as the true age of the pyramids, structures which, in the past, I have also independently identified as still possessing three separate identifiable stages of attempted casing stones for conservation, each significantly older or younger than each other, with the true exoskeleton of the structures made of stones far in excess of 1,000 tons. Join us next time, where I will expose the controlled opposition within the fringe fields of archaeology, which have stemmed from a growing pursuit for the truth of these facts, with a focus upon the water erosion hypothesis of the Great Sphinx, why it is a misdirection, and the Sphinx's true, original, undeniable identity, facts and truths exposed, which are undoubtedly highly compelling. There are so many astonishing, seemingly unexplainable features of the Great Pyramids of Giza. It makes one wonder why anyone would still believe the academic's tale of events, stating that they were the work of copper-wielding ancestors many thousands of years ago. And to sit across such vast area of land, with the largest Cheops covering many acres, yet is no more than a quarter of an inch from being perfectly cardinal aligned, just seems like a preposterous premise to push. In the previous video, the astonishing similarities that many years of exhausting research surrounding the unexplained ruins was explained, how MH the channel's producer had cataloged and mapped a number of identifiable features across many ruins, each of these identifying characteristics uniquely exclusive to one ancient civilization found upon and within unexplained ancient ruins across the entire globe. These signature similarities, and by default, their many differentiations, has allowed him to establish the identity of three separate civilizations. Civilizations which appear to have restarted consecutively, thus, as one would expect, branched off in vastly different directions of development, having to rebuild a modernized society from the remnants of the previous. Their past existences denied by historians for many years. But I strongly believe that we will be the generation which bucks the trend, shifting a paradigm which has affected nearly everyone's lives negatively in some way. As critical mass awareness approaches, as we continue to push onwards regardless of their attempts to stifle the truth, the efforts and sacrifices made and given by individuals who perceive this deceit as a breach of all of our independent liberty as human beings is finally cracking their shields of ignorance. Predictably, these same institutions who have made lives so difficult are now slowly admitting they did indeed once exist. The proof of these separate groups, which Mystery History's producer named the Cyclopean, Polygonal, and Neolithic civilizations, all had advanced capabilities, each separate from each other, yet fortunately, each possessing their own unique identifiable features which still litter many of these existing sites. Impenetrable fortresses, ingenious architectural design, visually impressive and mentally baffling methods of masonry are just a few of these ancient civilizations' legacies. Polygonal masonry, for example, yet to be fully understood by modern man in regard to its construction. The treasury of Atreus, which contains Cyclopean masonry techniques, displaying intimate knowledge of weight-bearing architecture, which the academically attested builders simply did not possess knowledge of. Underground towns and cities, the town in which the Flintstones inhabited, carved deep into some of the toughest bedrocks on Earth. Darren Kuyu, being one of the largest, which instead of being a fortress built above the ground, placed in a strategic location atop a hill or mountain, was carved into the Earth. To claim such feats were even possible by our own well-known ancient ancestors with the access to the tools they had at the time, is simply a preposterous illogical stance to take. One which, if given as the answers to such sites' origins, can be seen as nothing short of the abandonment of one's senses in return for an undisturbed income flow. A ridiculous explanation for the city's origins, forced upon the academic world for fear of losing their income and career, and in turn down the throats of students who desire good grades. Stretching many kilometers into the earth, 
enormous rolling stones were placed at strategic passageways. And although we have no idea how they move such stones, they were clearly placed there in an attempt to stop some form of invader, one they felt as if such measures were not undertaken would have been vulnerable to. The Hypogeum in Malta, with acoustic properties which we are yet to fully understand, the subject of our next video, with some astonishing discoveries we have unearthed during further research of this underground lair. These ancient sites tunneled deep underground, rumored to have been lit by miraculously clever, naturally fed gas-fueled lighting systems, balanced flames eternally lighting the inhabitation's pathways. Yet, as mentioned in our previous investigative film, the pyramid builders were responsible for the movement of stones, which reach well into the thousands of tons, setting them quite literally a world apart in their eventual technological capabilities. And due to our identification of no less than three separate phases of casing stones adorned upon the Great Pyramids, which due to the decayed and incredibly eroded condition of the stones beneath them, with casing stones also varying in age. It appears clear that they were all possible conservation efforts, undertaken at different times within ancient man's past, after no less than three cyclical developments of our civilization. These factors, mystery history not only perceives as clear evidence supporting the hypothesis of multiple lost generations, but also clearly displays their different methods of accomplishing these tasks. Furthermore, they can clearly show all who wish to study them, whether attempting to amass, as the channel has, a large, privately held collection of proofs, evidences, and upart studies that were hidden all over Earth, regardless of one's reasoning. I implore all to merely study the casing stones of Giza's pyramids, for more than enough proof of many lost civilizations, and the pyramids and their past builders' tremendous age. Additionally, we want to make it clear to all that we encourage discourse. The organically grown nature of the channel's demographic is its most important characteristic. We do not reject other people's disagreements to anything presented, or that is claimed on occasion, as long as they are willing to attempt constructive discourse in the pursuit of that which is the ultimate goal, the truth. If you have made a private discovery, or would prefer subjects or opinions to be shared with the creator with discretion, need advice or assistance regarding historical issues in any way, get Mystery History's opinion on something, don't hesitate in contacting him, the antiquarian creator who runs the show. This can be done via private email correspondence, Facebook, or Patreon. He does take a while to get back to you, but he always does. The channel, with hard-earned, hard-fought work and determination, has finally established a decent foothold in the doorway of antiquity presenting ruthlessly logic, non-conclusive, rationally grounded ponderings, which are solely based upon facts, facts the old order have no answers to. Thus, the channel's content is now the frontrunner in this cause and effect paradigm shift, slowly being witnessed all over the world. The consequential loss of academia's undeserved credibility, built upon a false persona of all-knowingness, slowly being realized by more and more people every day as a fraudulent attempt to profit from misplaced faith. Thus, public support and belief in their opinion diminishes by the day. Now perceived as a dangerous, highly efficient, naturally talented distributor and conveyor of the seeds of doubt, which sprout many curious yet logically sound questions, continues to cast this cloud of intellectual uncertainty over academia and those who are deservedly exposed as mere regurgitators of permitted information. Or a book pusher, whose sole content is to pick on easy targets, while offering no solutions to that which they object to with such vitriol, feeding from a sour cream which they skim from the top of a divisive status quo, offering no alternatives or even instilling any passion to have any positive effect in any way. They merely profit from their obedient maintenance of a division within our species, ultimately slowing our prosperity and moralities to a near stagnation. By sticking to my ethics and being completely honest regarding every subject, every word spoken, subject by subject, we are now the forerunner in our field, a starter pack of our hidden past, 
with a new sister channel which stitches each journey together into larger historical picture, fashioned as hour-long multi-subject feature-length films. So regardless of your own particular format preference, the channel now caters. However, although we may have established a large seat at the table, many individuals who masquerade as having the same mission at heart are nothing but saboteurs and moles, attempting to lead its followers on a wild goose chase, diverting traffic away from burning curiosities, controlled opposition within the derogatorily labeled field of fringe research, an audacious choice of wording, as it is an accusation by funders who intentionally permit only a certain area of global history to be studied, something which is far more fitting to the label fringe researcher than any astute individual who grew weary of their lack of knowledge with the method of construction of Cheops being just one among many thousands worldwide. And as promised, I will now expose one of these moles, their methods of misdirection, and how to spot them yourself. First, I shall play my original research on the Sphinx enclosure, who discovered it, the explanations they gave at the time, and after this previous research has been shown to you, I will explain what I find to not only be deliberately ignorant and complacent by one of the most highly regarded supposed fringe researchers of them all. Any public acceptance and acclamations should always be perceived as suspicious, simply due to the controversy of our role within challenging status quos. They should instead be looked upon as an indication that said individual is most likely compromised. This is due to their rarely being public popularizing of individuals in our field of study, and any that do are generally perceived by the powers that be as paid-off shills. Thus, the reality of the site's age is naturally far too controversial a question to ask. Anyone, alive or now dead, who claimed to be within the same field of study and discovery as me and many others, who receive such warm receptions by those they in essence should be a risk to, have outed themselves as nothing more than funded individuals, placed in particular positions of influence, on specific platforms, to try to lead a charge which, unfortunately, forms a tail-chasing orbit. One which, unless said follower recognizes these funded individuals' tactics, will never escape from slowly extinguishing any healthy inquisitive manner as mentioned in the previous video. The severe undulating erosion upon the walls of the Sphinx enclosure undoubtedly showed that the Sphinx had been heavily weathered long before the Sahara became a desert. Therefore, one must suspect that it could indeed be over 9,000 years old. Not knowing exactly how much rainfall there's been in the distant past, the Sphinx could indeed be far older than this. The most notable scholarly advocates, Robert Scotch, argues that the Sphinx may be far older than 12,000 years. Robert Baval and Graham Hancock propose that the Sphinx may have been built around 10,500 BC, during the last age of Leo. Anthony West believes everything on the Giza Plateau testifies to an advanced, secure, and long-settled civilization. Therefore, he suggests that the Sphinx may have been built not during the age of Leo, but a whole processional cycle earlier, in around 36,000 BC, a date he feels is more in keeping with the history of Egypt, as chronicled by certain Egypt kings. Regardless of an exact date, all of these talented Egyptologists propose a date set much further back within history than currently accepted, and they have provided considerable evidence to back up such conclusions. At the time of disclosure, the argument sent shockwaves through the Egyptologist establishment, not because of the datings. Egyptologists and mainstream historians have grown quite inept at ignoring data, but more because it was realized that there is, indeed, no other explanation for their arguments. There is little doubt that the Sphinx enclosure was subject to severe erosion within its lifetime, and although it could have been explained away as a naturally formed enclosure, we fortunately know from analysis that the limestone blocks dug out from there were then used within the building of nearby Sphinx Temple. Interestingly, no other site in Egypt shows the same type or degree of erosion. Was the evidence hidden away, concealed from the public in what could only be called a conspiracy. 
Sediment surrounding the base of the monuments and a once existing watermark upon the stones halfway up the Great Pyramid sides indicate just that. Two inch thick salt incrustations once found within inner chambers, silt sediments rising to 14 feet around the bases of the pyramids found to contain seashells and fossils that have been radiocarbon dated at nearly 12,000 years old, have indeed slowly vanished over the years. These sediments could only have been deposited in such great quantities by major sea flooding. A watermark was also once clearly visible on the limestone casing stones of the Great Pyramid. These stones were unfortunately unknowingly removed by invading Arabs. These watermarks were halfway up the sides of the pyramid, or about 400 feet above the present level of the Nile River, 200 feet above the base. It seems the last remaining shred of evidence, the enclosure, survived due to the talented individuals that were required to spot it. Individuals who are thankfully on our side. Egypt craves the mountains of money the structures generate, but also redistribute a small slice of such into stopping people from pondering for too long in regards to their age, astonishing construction, or indeed original purpose. The reason for the channel's creator reluctantly coming to this conclusion is that most of the content created by the individuals is done for the sole purpose of distracting said viewer and making their job of distinguishing that which is fact from that which is looser fiction, for example, the water erosion patterns do indeed exist and were first discovered by R. A. Schwaller de Lubitsch a French mystic and alternative Egyptologist with first claimed evidence of water erosion on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure made by him in the 1950s. John Anthony West, however, not surprisingly plagiarized Schwaller's work, jumping on his discovery and over a number of years building it up as not only having a fictional origin, but also age and reason for existence and also a widely spread conspiracy to try to quash people's suspicions of a greater age without encouraging them to pursue such watermarks further, or indeed any other possible reason for existing. All these individuals are funded deceivers, conceived due to an uncontrollable rise in people that had begun approaching the obvious facts that no matter how astonishing the artifacts, the gold death masks or jewels found drenching Egypt's museums, people began to perceive truth and understanding as a far more precious thing to observe and learn from. The fact is that the Sphinx was originally surrounded by water, the enclosure merely forming its banks. However, this is probably one of the most important discoveries I have ever made by searching archives and manuscript. Most highly qualified Egyptologists know that the enclosure was built to contain a lake, called the Lake of Anubis, a dog, not a cat. Furthermore, before the Spanish invasion, a water line could be seen nearly halfway up the Great Pyramid. And as my previous video explained also, within the Great Pyramid, a layer of sea salt, nearly two inches thick in some places, was reported, although none remains to this day, as it was taken away discreetly to cover up the reality and true age of the site, that there was indeed a great flood. And third and finally, the phases of casing stones which are clear attempts to conserve the monument from further erosion can be identified as the work of at least three separate lost civilizations. This strongly suggests that throughout our existence, we have been susceptible to near extinction on several occasions. Why did the Egyptian authorities cover up what was found behind Gottenbing's door? Why was there a water line that could be seen halfway up the pyramids themselves? And why did they dispose of proof of sea flooding without telling the world? We find the entire series of events highly compelling. <laughs>